next to you as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you tonight indeed that Jesus saves. Thank you for the gift of eternal life through his precious and holy name and because of his perfect sacrificial blood. God, you have you've been so good to us. You've answered so many prayers. We've seen you lift up the fallen. We've seen you heal the sick. And God, we've watched you do so many wonderful things and we expect those wonders tonight. Bless those who will come and sing. Bless Brother Ronnie and bless us to hear your word tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. Praise team. We don't do request, but we, this is a request. <laughs> this is the end of the request. <laughs> Join us on that chorus. Sing it with us again. Do you know?
Let your light shine, let your light shine for all to see. Start a fire in my soul, fan the flame and make it grow. So there's no doubt or denying. Let it burn so brightly with everyone around you see. That it's you, that it's you that we need. Start a Spark to start a whole place. It only takes a little faith. Let's start right here in this city. So these old walls will never be the same. Over and over again, I hear your voice in my head. They need to know I need to go. Spirit, won't you follow my heart? Start a fire in my soul. Fan the flame and make it grow. Oh, 
light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Then I 
shall bow with humble adoration. so small standing here weeping as I'm coming clean and the secrets I'm keeping I call so much pain to the ones I love most and the falling apart And there's nothing left inside of me But a longing for you, a longing to be the man that you
<laughs> but I'm going to be watching them. <clears throat> all right. To all these uh, this praise team and singers, thank you so much. And musicians, thank you so much. That was wonderful tonight. That was really uh, refreshing and uh, encouraging. Certainly a worshipful spirit attitude prevails and has each night. The men that were with me Monday night and Tuesday night uh, certainly enjoyed being here and being a part of the services. And we've felt like we have uh, <clears throat> genuinely worshiped the Lord. And certainly that's true tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Kenny, for giving me the opportunity, the invitation to come. And I've certainly enjoyed myself and getting to meet uh, the good folks here at First Baptist. And uh, so we, uh, we've just been really, really blessed. I uh, was blessed. I had a gentleman here somewhere brought me these, uh, brought me some Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> and uh, he said this morning they were hot and uh, they can be heated again. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Man, if I'd known he was going to be that gracious, I would have talked about how I, how I like, uh, I really need a new TV set at home. <laughs> I, need a, I, need a, I need a 50 inch flat screen. <laughs> so uh, if you run across one of those blue light specials somewhere, well, just call me. I'll come get it. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, it has been a joy to be here. I've enjoyed myself immensely. And I mentioned last night, I guess it was, pray for me. We're, we're leaving next uh, Tuesday and headed for Israel. And so I'm excited about that. And maybe I can go again next year and some of you could go with us. That'd be great. It'd be wonderful. And uh, so uh, anyway, we, uh, we're looking forward to that. So pray for us when you think about us. And again, we'd invite you over to our conference in November. We've registered over 130, 140 preachers in that conference the last 10 years plus. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, then we have a lot of, of course, we have to balance that out with a lot of normal people. We invite a lot of normal people to come in as well for that. And um, we'll feed you four meals a day. And um, we'll preach to you and sing in the mornings and the evenings, let you have afternoon off for a nap. And um, and so that's uh, always the second Sunday in November through that Wednesday next year. It's like the 8th or this year, this fall, the 8th through the 11th. We'd really love for you to come and get in on that. But it's been a real joy to meet you. You've been easy to preach to and certainly a very worshipful spirit. And I've not felt any, um, any real nervousness. I, I heard about this young preacher, and I can remember well being a young preacher a long time ago um, and just being real nervous. And he... Uh, he got to think, what am I going to do to, to overcome this nervousness? And, and he just, every time he'd get up to preach, he'd be so nervous. And so he went to a conference and there was an older preacher got up and he, he, uh, he just, he noticed how, how calm he seemed and how tranquil and man, I wish I had that. And right off, right off the bat, that, that preacher, uh, told a joke and he said, man, everybody just laughed and calmed them down. Everybody, this, the whole service seemed like if there was any tension in it, it was gone after that. He said the man told this story, and it's an older man, uh, pastor, he got up and he said, uh, you know, folks, he said, I, I'd just like to say that some of the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. Well, it just shocked the whole congregation. And then he said, well, of course, I'm talking about my dad's wife. I'm talking about my mother. Oh, everybody relaxed and laughed, kind of like you did then. So that young preacher said, oh, i got to remember that. i got to remember that. To, 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 next time I preach, I'm going to tell a joke. And that'll. So sure enough, a couple of weeks later, he got an invite. And so he got up uh, to preach, and he was he thinking, come, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to tell a joke. I'll tell a joke. Uh, uh, he, said, um, uh, he said, folks, and, uh, so I, I just like to say that some, some, of the, so, some of the best years of my life was... Uh, uh, spent in the arms of another man's wife. And they all looked at him and it really tensed up then. And he said, and right now I can't remember who it was, but he said, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> any young preachers here tonight, that's good to tell another man's joke, but you don't want to mess up the punchline. You could really, really get in trouble on that. So, anyway, all right, God bless you. John chapter 11, if you have your Bibles tonight, John chapter 11. And uh, this has um, become a favorite uh, sermon of mine, I guess. I've preached it several times. I've preached it at Unity in a number of places. And, and so, uh, anyway, I, I want to bring it to you tonight. I hope it will be a blessing to you. Uh, having got to go to Israel last year for my first time, and uh, now these places I can see them, you know, Jerusalem and, and um, Bethany and Bethlehem and Jericho and the Sea of Galilee and, and all these places that are mentioned, Nazareth and Cana and a lot of them we got to visit. And so I see them. And of course, the setting of this story in John 11 is uh, Bethany, of course. It's only about a, about a mile and a half, two miles out of the city of Jerusalem. And really, it's hard now to tell when you go out of Jerusalem to go into Bethlehem or Bethany. It's all uh, so close together there, and the city is spread out. Um, but uh, anyway, Bethany, Bethany came to be uh, what we might call the Lord's home or kind of his headquarters when he was down in the Jerusalem area. If you read the Gospels, the first year or two of his ministry, uh, his, uh, he spent a lot of time around Capernaum and up around the Sea of Galilee. And if you've been to the Holy Land, you know why that's so beautiful. It's just beautiful hillsides. It's where he, of course, fed the 5,000. And a lot of things took place up there. It's where he called Peter, James, and John, Andrew, and, and uh, off the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen they were. And so it's just so beautiful up there and, and tranquil, peaceful, and, and so the Lord spent quite a bit of time. But it, when he was around Jerusalem, it's pretty obvious he spent um, some time there in uh, Bethany and became closely associated with this family that we'll read about here in the scriptures uh, tonight, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so let's just read a few verses and then I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of it's good to be close to Jesus. These songs, a lot of these songs really, uh, uh, all of them in one way or the other, certainly emphasized the importance of Christ and what he is to us. And a lot of, a lot of Christians don't seem to realize that really their, their Christianity really is all about Jesus. The church is important and, and that's an understatement to say that. But I'll tell you, if all you've got is church, you don't have what, what really makes Christianity. Christianity is Christ and our relationship with Him. And, and it's all about Him and, and what gets us in that worship spirit and attitude. I mean, when you come in here, and as we said last night, man, you just go to talking about Jesus and you go to praising Jesus and you go to glorifying and honoring Him, man, He'll show up. He'll come on the scene. And that's what real worship is. It certainly it has to do with being in his presence and acknowledging him and, and adoring him and praising him. Well, I, I want to be close to Jesus. And you'll see what I mean as we look in these verses. John chapter 11, it says in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he, that is Lazarus, was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples saith unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. 
Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now we'll stop reading right there. We'll look at some other scripture there in just a moment and confine our attention pretty much to these scriptures tonight. On the subject, it's good to be close to Jesus. I want to emphasize some things about Mary and Martha and Lazarus and uh, some things we learn from them and why it's good to be close to Jesus. So just stay with me for a few moments and you'll, you'll see why I say that. Uh, let me just say something about this matter of getting close to Jesus. Obviously, it begins with a relationship. You have to know him as your personal Lord and Savior. That's the only way you can get close to Jesus. You have to be saved. Don't Nicodemus, you must be born again. John 4, he told that woman at the well that she must drink of that living water. So you must know the Lord as your personal Savior. That's the only way you can get close to the Lord. So that's where it begins. But even after we're saved, there's a possibility a person could, could maybe backslide, get away from the Lord. Not lose your salvation, of course. But to get a distance from the Lord. You know the Bible says later on uh, that, that Peter followed him afar off. And next thing you know Peter's doing some things that are not too comely for a believer to be doing. And that's what happens when we begin to follow the Lord afar off. We begin to look more like the world than we do like a Christian. And so, uh, uh, but, but you know later on Peter got close to the Lord. And so relationships where it all begins. But Peter needed a personal revival, and thank God Peter got a personal revival. And then, uh, then later you find Peter standing on the day of Pentecost preaching, and 3,000 people get saved. So it's pretty obvious he got back up close to the Lord. Um, so I, I want to I emphasize that. And I want to say that, for instance, in James chapter number 4, uh, he tells us over there how we can uh, how we can actually get close to the Lord and how important that is. And just so I don't misquote it, uh, let me just read you a verse or two. Don't lose your place there uh, in um, in John, but let me let me read you this in James chapter number four. Listen to this. He said in verse eight, "Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you." Now that's. That's, uh, that's how you get close to the Lord. So I want to encourage you tonight that if you're, uh, well, let me just ask you a couple of questions. And one question I could answer for you. The second question I can't answer. The first question I would ask you, um, and I can answer it for you. The question is, how close are you to the Lord? How close are you to the Lord? Now think about that for a moment. And you might be thinking, now, Brother Ronnie, you just said you could answer that. And I can. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. And I don't have any cards that we could lay out. I don't, you know, I don't have all of that. I don't even have a talking frog. I'd love to have a talking frog, but I don't have a talking frog. And you'd have to have been here other night to appreciate that. But anyway, uh, but I can answer that for you. In fact, let's just take your pastor. Let's just single him out. Everybody here would like to know just how close Brother Kenny is to the Lord. Well, I'll just tell you how close he is to the Lord. We've fellowshiped a little bit the last day or two, not a whole lot. But I have discovered this about your pastor. He is as close to the Lord as he wants to be. Well, that's true of all of us, isn't it? That's not really too profound, but it is pretty profound after all. For all of us are as close to the Lord as we want to be. That's how close you are to the Lord tonight. And so we would hope that being in a service like this and hearing songs like we heard tonight and, and last night and Monday night, that that would provoke us to want to get a little bit closer. 
You know, there are people I hang around from time to time, and just being around them makes me want to get closer to Jesus. There are songs that I hear from time to time, and those songs make me want to get a little closer to Jesus. I hear sermons and preaching from time to time, and that makes me want to get a little bit closer to Jesus. I sure hope this service tonight and all that's taking place here will make you want to get close to the Lord. So the first question, how close are you to the Lord? The second question I can't answer but uh, let me ask the second question. Has there been a time in your life when you were closer to the Lord than you are tonight? Well, I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that. But the Holy Spirit has a way of provoking us. You know, the Lord preached a lot of times and carried on conversations. And a lot of times he would do that by asking a question. Somebody might ask him a question. Then he would re in return ask them a question. And it provokes thought. And it stimulates the heart. And just that very question being put out there, and the Spirit of God then takes that, puts it in your heart, and you have to answer it. Uh, you have to answer it one way or the other. Has there been a time in your life when you were closer to the Lord than you are tonight? Well, we would hope that tonight would be a time when you would get renewed and restored and revived and at least get back to that point where you were close to the Lord and then, then start your journey of getting even closer and closer and closer to the Lord. And so it's good to be close to Jesus. So with all that being said, going back to our text tonight, we see a family that I believe was as close to the Lord as any family or any people that you might read about uh, anywhere in the Word of God. I don't know if there was a threesome, uh, including Peter, James, and John, that were any closer to the Lord than this threesome of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And the Lord, the, the Word of God goes to uh, some effort here to, to cause us to know that, to make sure we know that. I don't think anybody would doubt that the Lord loved his disciples. And then those three, Peter, James, and John, were kind of like an inner circle that were closer to him, seemed like maybe than the others. Um, and maybe that's because they wanted to be. Maybe that's the reason they were closer, not just because the Lord wanted them to be. Maybe they wanted to be. So um, here's this family. We don't know anything about parents. We don't know anything about children, anything like that. But we know about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so the Bible is pretty clear about how close they were to the Lord. In fact, it says that when, uh, when Lazarus was sick, that in verse 3, his sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. They didn't even mention Lazarus' name. The messenger that they sent went to the Lord and said, He whom thou lovest is sick. Now that messenger, it's not recorded, may have used Lazarus' name. But the scripture just simply says, They said, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Jesus and Lazarus had a very, very good, close relationship. He might have been, he might have been the Lord's best friend on this earth. You say, well, he wasn't a disciple. Well, you know, God's got different purposes, different places for all of us. But uh, it certainly is true if you'll read the Gospels that the Lord liked to come around Bethany and he liked to come around these people, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. While later on, when he, when he found out that uh, Lazarus, when he was told that Lazarus was sick and that then Lazarus died, finally the Lord said in verse 11, these things said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. In other words, he was dead. Now this same gospel John tells us that God so loved the whole world. So none of us would doubt tonight. Somebody say, well, how much did God love the whole world? Well, he told us in John 3, 16, didn't he? That he loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Well, that's an that's a unbelievable, un, almost unbelievable, unimaginable, almost beyond comprehension kind of love. And, um, but that's how much God loved this world. He gave us his son to die for us on that old rugged cross and all God's people said amen. amen hallelujah praise God thank God and so I'm here tonight because God loved me you're here tonight and if you're a child of God it's because God loved you well I'm glad for God's love that cannot be overemphasized but isn't it isn't it unique that in the same gospel that the Bible says that um, 
In verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, why would it say that? He's already said in John 3, 16 that he loves the whole world. But I think there's a special relationship here. And we can all identify with that. You know, being a Christian, being a child of God, having the love of God poured and shed abroad in my heart, I can say I love the whole world. I wouldn't compare my love for the world with the same love God has for the world, but I can say I love the world. We took up that offering Monday night for Muslim Bibles. I want to see Muslims saved. I want to see Muslims saved. I'm willing to give some money and get some Bibles purchased and get some Bibles put in the hands of some missionaries and some people who can get some Bibles put in the hands of some Muslims who don't know anything about the Lord Jesus. And with everything the Muslim world's done to America and done to us and done to Christianity, well, boy, I sure would love to hear of some Muslims getting saved by the grace of God. I don't hate Muslims. I hate what they represent, what they stand for. I hate all of that. But, uh, man, I, I tell you, that would be a thrill to hear. And we have missionaries in Muslim territory and world tonight telling, trying, to, trying to tell them about Jesus. And so I can say I love the world. But now, wait a minute. I can say I love the world. That's one thing. But when I say, for instance, I love my church. When I say I love my church, the Unity Baptist Church, where I've had the privilege to be for 36 plus years. I just a little bitty feller when I went there. Just a little bitty guy. But I love my church. I love the world, but I'm just going to say it. I love my church. Man, they're a special people to me. Pastors can understand this, identify with this. Brother Kenny, you know what I'm talking about. I love my church. We buried our oldest deacon last week. He was 86 years old. He was a deacon when I got there. He has stood by my side for 36 plus years. And we've been in many a deacon meeting and we have served together and we've worked together and we've laughed together and we've cried together and we've, we've prayed together and, and, and we've just had such a tremendous relationship for 36 plus years. Brother Doyle Bennett and I never had one cross word. Isn't that amazing? There's a lot of people in that church like that today. They're just like family to me. And when I say I love my church, man, my heart is still grieving and broken tonight over the passing of that dear, dear friend. He was a deacon, but he was more than that to me. I love my church. I love my church. Well, hey, but wait a minute. When I say I love the world, when I say I love the church, but when I say I love my family, I love my family. My wife, and I've got a son and a daughter, and I've got a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law ain't bad. She's pretty good, you know. <laughs> son-in-laws, you know what son-in-laws are. I found out years ago, they are the scum of the earth. <laughs> son-in-laws. And so, uh, anyway, we got a pretty good scum. He's, you know, for, wasn't nobody good enough really for my daughter, but... She thought he was, so you just kind of go along with him. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, so I love my family. I mean, I love my family. Man, oh man. Well, wait a minute. I say I love the world. Well, sure. Why well, I say I love my church. Well, of course. But when I say I love my family, I mean, that's, but here it is. I got two grand boys. And when I say I love Bo and Jack, I really love Bo and Jack. Bo six and Jack is two. I love my granddaughter. And she ain't even been born yet. <laughs> She's on the way. Sometime in July. And I see my little granddaughter. And I'm going to super spoil her. We've done a good job with Bo and Jack, but we're really going to super spoil that granddaughter. I love them. Now, you see what I'm saying? The different levels. And, and I, I tell you, I just believe the Lord had a special love for Mary and Martha and Lazarus. I, tell you, I believe every opportunity he got to go into their home, he went into their home. They could uh, see the Lord coming at a distance and maybe some servant or somebody in the household would come and say, Jesus and his disciples are coming. Martha would head straight to the kitchen. Mary would run out to meet him because in a few moments she's going to be down on her knees at the feet of Jesus while he's teaching and 
preaching and speaking to them and the disciples and Martha's in there cooking them up something, getting them. I mean, I mean, their home was the kind of home where Jesus felt welcome and wanted. I want my home to be that way. I know he's in heaven tonight. I know where he is. But, but through the person of his spirit, I want Jesus to be wanted and welcomed in my I want him to want to be in the Bearfield household. Man, I want him to feel. That's the way he felt about this place. Man. And yet, it really is good to be close to Jesus. They're going to need this. Because as we soon discover, Lazarus, of course, is going to die. Let me talk about that and then we'll bring the message to a close in just a few moments. Let me say tonight, it's good to be close to Jesus in times of darkness. In times of darkness. You know, there's a time period here where Mary and Martha and even Lazarus are in a time of darkness. They're not quite sure what's going on. Jesus in the previous chapter had been there in Jerusalem area. They took up stones to stone him. He fled away. And the Bible tells us in the last part of chapter number 10 that he went away again beyond Jordan to the place where John at first baptized. Now that's 25, 30 miles away from Jerusalem. So he's down there in that area, in that region somewhere. Then chapter 11, they send a messenger to tell him that uh, Lazarus uh, is sick. And so not having vehicles and communication system and all like we do now, there's a time period there where they're really in some darkness. And they've already said, we've read where Mary and Martha both would have said, Lord, if you'd have been here, Lazarus would not have died. So they're sending word, if we can get the Lord back up here, then he can touch Lazarus and he'll be all right. And of course that didn't happen. But... Um, it was really a time of darkness uh, for them while, while they're waiting to hear from the Lord. They're just not too sure what's going on. Could I ask you tonight, maybe you've been in a time of darkness in your life. You wasn't really sure what was going on. I've been in some times like that. I like, I like it when everything is bright and clear and the lights are on and you can see what's going on and all around you and you just, everything. But sometimes we get caught in the darkness, not only literally, but spiritually and emotionally. And we can get caught in the dark and we're not too sure what's going on. And sometimes it may be in a hospital room. Sometimes it may be in the ICU part of that hospital. Eventually it might be down to the funeral home. But we get in times of darkness, and like I said last night, we might even come to the place where we just kind of scratch our head and say, I don't know what to do. So in these times of darkness, and that's where they were, but you know what? They were close to the Lord. They were close to the Lord. And so even if you are in a time of darkness tonight, and you're trying to figure out what's going on or why what is going on is going on, you just can't hardly figure it out. Why is my son so rebellious? Why is my daughter so rebellious? Why are my grandchildren seem like running as fast as they can away from God? We taught them the things of God. We brought them to church. We, we carried them to Sunday school. And now I don't understand why, why they don't want church, why, don't, why they don't want the Lord. You can get caught in darkness. You've been a good spouse. You've been a good husband. But your spouse found someone she was more interested in. You've been a good wife. You've been a faithful wife. But now your husband has turned his head in another direction. He's found somebody else. And you're wondering why. You're wondering why is this going on? What's happening, Lord? And it's just a time of darkness. And uh, you know, in a perfect world, we don't have to worry about all that stuff. But, but we're not in a perfect world. And you may be a Christian tonight. And you may be close to the Lord. But things happen. Bad things happen. And you can find yourself in a world of darkness and you're not too sure what really is going on. So I'm saying to you tonight, it's good to be close to Jesus. Even if you are in a time of darkness. You know, as children, I never remember um, being afraid of the dark. I just remember being afraid of what was in the dark. And some people are so fearful of what's in the dark that they won't go to sleep without a light on. 
They'll either leave a light on in the bathroom or the hallway or something and, and maybe crack the door or they'll buy a little night light and plug it in the wall. But they just have to have some light. That light brings a little comfort to it. But what happens if the electricity goes off and there's no light and you're in total darkness? Well, I'm saying spiritually speaking tonight, even if you are in a world of darkness tonight and you're really not sure what's going on, let me just say this. It's good to be close to Jesus. In their darkness, thank God, they were close to Jesus. But then it moves on. Not only is it good to be close to Jesus in times of darkness, but in times of delay. It's good to be close to Jesus. They thought they were getting word to him, and surely soon as he hears that Lazarus is sick, wherever he is, down near Jordan or wherever it might be, that immediately... He will tell his disciples, pack up, gather your stuff up, let's go. We've got to get back to Bethany. Lazarus is sick. He may die. We've got to get there in a hurry. But look what happened. The Bible says in verse 4, when Jesus heard that, that he was sick, he said, this sickness is not in a death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he, that is, Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Wow. The Lord did what? Abode two days still. Instead of in that moment, immediately gathering everything together and rushing back. It's, it's going to take him a day or two to get back. And, and walking and going as fast as they can go. It's going to take him several hours, a day or two to get back. But not only does he not do that, he even delays for two days. He remained there. The Bible said in verse 6, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then in verse 7, then after that, saith he to his disciple, let us go into Judea again. Now here's a delay. Let me say that it's good to be close to Jesus, even in times of delay. Now sometimes those delays can be of the devil. You know, there's a real interesting truth brought out in the book of Daniel, where Daniel prayed. Read about it. And the angel, after Daniel had prayed, and the angel finally got back to him with the answered prayer. But it took him about two or three weeks to get back for this angel to get back to Daniel with the answered prayer. And he told Daniel, he said, the, the answer was already given. But he said he was in this fight with, this, um, with these demons, with these, uh, these fallen angels. Read about it in the book of Daniel. It's pretty interesting reading. And... Uh, and so there was a delay. There was a devilish delay. Sometimes the devil is allowed to, to hinder things. Paul told the church at, at uh, Thessalonica, he said, I would have come to you many times before. But he said this, Satan hindered us. So there can be devilish delays, if you will. But this is not a delay caused by the devil. This is a divine delay. This is a delay that the Lord has imposed upon this whole situation himself. So I want to say to you tonight that in these times of delay, it is good to be close to Jesus. Let me just say this also. If the Lord does delay, mark it down, he has a purpose. He doesn't do anything accidentally, haphazardly, coincidentally. You and I live under the hand of the providential hand of God. I love to preach about that. Thank God for his providence in our lives. We're not living by chance or by luck. We live by the, by the very hand and the providence of almighty God. And so the Lord in his providence here deems it wise to wait two days. Now, when you read on the story, you know that by the time the Lord gets there now, Lazarus is going to be dead. But this delay, not of the devil, but of the Lord himself. That may be the reason sometimes he tells us to wait. Wait on the Lord. And Isaiah 40 said, you shall renew your strength. Waiting on the Lord. That's a hard thing to do. It is for me anyway. Waiting, but sometimes waiting is so necessary.
And I've discovered this. Most of the time, if God tells us to wait, he has a great purpose for that. And he has a great blessing in store. He said, if you will wait on the Lord in Isaiah 40, you can renew your strength. And that word renew in Isaiah 40 literally means, renew means to exchange. It means to exchange. And he's already said, look, even the, even the, the youths will faint and grow weary. So at, at our best, at our best strength, we're going to grow faint and we're going to grow weary. So he says, if you'll wait on the Lord, you can exchange. You can exchange your weakness, your weariness, your faintness for his strength. And he says, then you'll be able to walk and not faint. Then he says, you'll be able to run and not be weary. Then he says, you'll be able to fly or to soar and not come fumbling, tumbling down. So when the Lord says, wait. He's got a reason. He's got a purpose. And so we can make that great exchange, my weakness, for his strength. And then I can do far more in his strength by waiting on him than I could have in my own strength and trying to do it on my own. Now Paul, said, Paul said, I had to learn that. Now, if Paul had to learn it, I know that's going to be a tough test for me. But Paul said in Philippians 4, he said, look, I have learned to be content. He said, I have learned to wait on God. In other words, I have learned, he said, sitting in a prison cell in Rome in Philippians chapter 4, he said, I have learned to be content. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See. Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 12 when he talks about that experience that he had. He wasn't all that sure about all the experience. He said, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. But he said, called up the third heaven and saw things. And God just wouldn't let me tell what I saw. But he said, I've come back now. And he said, God's given me this thorn in the flesh. And he said, I prayed about it. He said, I prayed and asked God to remove it. And God wouldn't remove it. But he said, God did answer my prayer. And so he said, I prayed and said, God, remove it. But God said, no, I'm not going to remove it. But he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Just wait on me. So Paul said, now, therefore, I glory in my infirmity. I glory in my weakness. Why? Because he said, he said, God said to me that his strength, my strength, God said, is made perfect. Watch this. In your weakness. You see, sometimes we're too strong. Not really, but we think we are. But when we're really, that last song that they sang, and that confession about, about how I, I need thee, and, and how I've, I, I've now I've come to this place where I want to I give you everything. I don't want to withhold anything, Lord. I want to give all of me up to you, Lord, I want you. And that's the attitude we must come to, and that's finally where Paul came to. And we have to learn that. Well... In times of delay, and if the Lord delays, he's got a reason. He talks about it in those scriptures. You know, he said up there in verse 4, he said, this sickness is not unto death. He knew that Lazarus was going to die, but he tells them up front, this is, this is not, a, not a death that's just because of sickness. He said, this death is going to be for the glory of God. Now, what should be our attitude? Our attitude should be as Paul's was. When Paul said, whether in my life or whether by death, his desire and goal ultimately and only was to magnify that Christ be magnified in me. That ought to be our desire. If God could get more glory out of my death than he could my life, am I submitted and surrendered enough to say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to die? Well, so there's going to be a delay. Because Lazarus must die. And we know that God's going to get glory out of his death. But who is this? This may be the Lord's best friend. This man is as near to him as any man we know of in the New Testament. And yet, look at his situation. Don't think, friend, just because some bad thing is happening to you that God is mad with you. Don't think just because some 
terrible thing has happened, whether it's a death or whatever it might be, that God doesn't like you. This may have been his best friend. I'm inclined to believe it was. You can disagree with me if you want to. But I'm saying just from what I can read and when I read over this, I'm more convinced every time I preach this that Lazarus maybe was his dearest friend. And yet, he's going to die. But they're close to Jesus. Hang on. It's going to be okay. Because this family is close to Jesus. Can you feel that? Can you sense that, what we're trying to see and what we're trying to say tonight? How important it is, how good it is to be close to Jesus. There were some other reasons. Look, look at the phrase quickly. Uh, verse number 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then look in verse 15, this will knock your shoes off. Verse 15, Jesus said, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. What did you just say, Lord? The Lord said to those disciples, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent. Everything the Lord did had an intent, had a purpose. To the intent, you may believe. <laughs> wow. Lazarus had to die. So he could teach these disciples and later Mary and Martha both about the importance of believing. Do you have, do we have any concept tonight of really just how important it really is to the Lord that we believe? That's what he wants out of you and me more than anything else. Listen, without faith, it is impossible to please him. You want to please God? Trust him. Believe him. Have faith in him. And you'll please the Lord. He said, I'm glad that I wasn't there. This is going to help you in believing. Wow. I've got to hurry. It's good to be close to Jesus in our darkness, in our delays, and yes, even in disappointments. In disappointments. When we get down to Martha and even to Mary, we discover they're very, very, very disappointed. Quickly, look what Martha said there in, uh, in verse number 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Now, you don't even have to read between the lines. Just read the words and you see pretty clearly, pretty quickly, she's disappointed. Lord, if you'd have been here, Lazarus would not have died. See, she's got some belief issues. Oh, oh, oh. No, no, really? Well, look what she said in verse 22. Oh, but I know, Lord, but I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Really? Look what the Lord said to her in verse 39. Jesus said, take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He's been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. <laughs> she doesn't have as much faith as she thinks she does. And probably you and I don't either. But the Lord knows how to bring us along and teach us how to trust him and believe. So he's going to help them. She's disappointed. But I says, well, Martha's not really the real spiritual one, though. Mary is the spiritual one, really. Okay, let's look at Mary. The Bible said in verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. But notice what she said, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Has he heard that before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just a few minutes before, he heard the same thing from Martha. You know what? Mary and Martha have been talking. And they both come to the same conclusion. That Lord, that if Jesus had been here, Lazarus would not have died. Can you imagine going back a day or two, three or four by now? Go back four days. Maybe they were in the room with Lazarus and he died. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the first things they said was, 
if Jesus had only been here. If Jesus had only been here. So they've got faith. And they love the Lord. But um, their faith needs working on just like mine does. And so in disappointment. You ever been disappointed? <laughs> They're disappointed with the Lord. You ever been disappointed with the Lord? You say, <laughs> Hey, look at me. He already knows. <laughs> Probably your spouse already knows. Others who are close to you already know. They've heard some things you've said. They've watched the way you've done. You, 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 haven't, you haven't been singing quite with the same joy that you used to sing. Well, you haven't frequented church quite like you used to. And it's pretty obvious to people that are close to you that you... Maybe a little disappointed with the Lord. Oh, preacher, I, 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 would, I would never, oh yeah, oh yeah. You wouldn't be the first one. And you're not going to be the last one. And hang on. He can handle it. He can handle it. Look, listen to me. He knows you and you and you and you better than you know you, 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 yourself. But he loves us anyway. Amen. He's so patient. He, he's so gentle with us. He knows what we're made out of. He knows we live in a world that's full of doubt and disbelief. He knows that. And a world full of disappointment. Man, the Lord disappointed me one time. Oh, I'm, I was a fool. But I had my plans. Now y'all forgive me, but I'm just, you know, I'm just a, just a farm boy from Mississippi. I grew up on a cotton farm. <laughs> I didn't like picking cotton and I didn't like chopping cotton. Did a little bit of that. Thank God my granddaddy bought a cotton picker one day. I thought it was the most beautiful machine I had ever seen in my life. I spoke in tongues for three days. <laughs> and I wasn't even a Christian. Oh my. Anyway, I wanted to farm. My wife now was at that time the daughter of a farmer. She wanted to marry a man just like her daddy. She told me when we were dating. She said, I would never marry a doctor. And she had a reason. You know, they're gone all the time and all that kind of stuff. And she said, I would never marry a preacher. <laughs> Uh-oh. Whoa. But God put us together. And we stood at an altar. And she said something. I didn't know any better, so I said I wilt, and I've been wilting ever since. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, look at me. She married a farmer. That was my goal, desire, and plan. Put me on a tractor and just let me go. There's no smell like the smell of dirt turned over in the spring. Now, you don't want to hear all that, but... I've got you here. Let me just tell you about it. Oh, I'm plowing my cotton. 19 years old. Minding my own business. And the Lord says, you're going to preach. I knew he couldn't be talking to me. My mother-in-law knew that he couldn't be talking to me. You know what she said? This is how I know this. She said, why? To my wife, her daughter, scum of the earth. Why does he want to preach? He's already teaching a Sunday school class. Well, I don't know. But I said, Lord, look, no, Lord, I got all these plans. I've got all these plans. 
And besides, Donna already said she, she don't want to be a preacher. Lord, you knew all this when we got married. What in the world are you doing, Lord? I got cotton to plow. I'll go to church Sunday. I'll take off early and go to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Lord, let me do my thing. And the Lord said, no. You're going to do my thing. Took a few months. And then August the 5th, 1973, one day, one day before he surrendered to preach. And we didn't even know each other. If we'd have been born the same day like it, we might have been twins and wouldn't even know it. <laughs> but I remember when I said, yes, Lord, I'll preach. I said, Lord, I don't think I can get up there for 30 minutes. Ta-da. <laughs> Was I right or what? Y'all been real patient. Thank you. Anyhow, I got to tell this. So let me get, if y'all to listen faster, I can talk a whole lot faster. This is all y'all's fault. Don't be angry with me. Don't leave out here now. I believe that's the longest winded preacher. If he ever gets him back, I'm going to bring me some Krispy Kreme donuts with me, church. Man. Oh, I was. Now, when I finally surrendered, I was so happy and so glad, but I was really a little disappointed. Lord, just let me do what I want to do. <laughs> but I want to tell you something with this hand raised and this hand raised. I'm so glad God called me to preach. I'm so glad. He was right all the time. I was the one who was wrong. I discovered that his plan was much better than my plan. God was saving me. All my buddies that was farming back then are all bankrupt. Here I am doing pretty good tonight. <laughs> oh, me. You ever been disappointed? I'm going to tell you. It's good to be close to the Lord even when you're disappointed. People will disappoint you. Oh, yes, they will. Sometimes people in your own family. Sometimes people in your church. Sometimes people you work with, people you love, people will disappoint you. But it's good to be close to Jesus. Just because you're close to Jesus won't mean that you don't get disappointed. But I'll tell you, you can sure handle the disappointment a lot better if you're close to Jesus. Now let me close and combine the last two points. In times of disturbance and even death, it's good to be close to Jesus. Their world is turned upside down now. Great disturbance. Lazarus even dies. He's dead. But they're close to Jesus. They're going to be able to handle this. When I think about people that have been through great disturbances, but they were close to Jesus, I think about people like Charles Weigel, who when he surrendered to the ministry and evangelism and preaching, his wife did say to him, I will not be a preacher's wife. She refused and she left him. But Charles Weigel sat down at a piano and wrote these words to this great song. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Wow. In his disturbance, disappointment, he was close enough to Jesus that when this great crisis came, out of that came that great song, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. What about Luther Bridges, who was preaching in a revival meeting, lived in Kentucky, but he was all somewhere else, and preaching in a revival meeting, and word got to him that his house had burned, that his wife and children all perished in the flame. And then later he writes that great song, Jesus, 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 sweetest name. I know. He said, you know, it's Jesus that keeps me singing. How could he do that? He was close to Jesus. 
What about Joseph Scriven? Whose fiance was killed crossing a bridge on a, on a, on a cart, on a coach in uh, uh, Bainbridge, Northern Ireland. And, and the horse, they lost control and, and the carriage fell over to the side and his fiance was killed. But it was Joseph Scriven who wrote that great song. What a friend we have in Jesus. He was close to Jesus. What about Horatio Spafford? Who couldn't make the journey with his wife and four daughters from America to England. Because he had business to tend to, so they went on and on their journey over the ship sank. He lost his daughters. His wife made it to the other shore, sent him back a telegram, two words, saved alone. So he immediately rushes around, catches the next ship going across the Atlantic. The story's told that when he came in the region, the area where the ship had went down that had his daughters. Maybe the pilot, the captain of the ship, somebody told him, said, this is the area. This is the and he writes that great song. It is well with my soul. Huh. I'm just saying tonight, folks, it's good to be close to Jesus. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment of prayer. Our musicians will come and we'll conclude the service as the pastor sees fit tonight. I'd like to invite you to come. Draw nigh to God. Can we get closer? Oh, sure. Sure, every one of us can get a step closer. And the Lord even said this, if you'll draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. You make a move toward me, God says, I'll make a move toward you. Let's pray. Lord, touch every heart. Thank you tonight that we can know you and not only know you, but be close to you. Lord, I want to be closer today than I was yesterday. I want to be closer tomorrow than I am today. Close to Jesus. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that does not know Jesus. They need to come tonight and trust Christ as Savior. And then there are others that just need to come and say, Lord, I just want to get a little bit closer. Maybe some father or husband wants to take his family and just come and kneel and pray and say, Lord, I want my family to be closer. I want our home to be a home like was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. A place where Jesus would be welcomed and wanted and where he would want to. Spend time. Could be a teenager, a young person tonight that just needs to slip down here and say, Oh Lord, I want to be closer to you. Close to Jesus. It's good to be close to Jesus. Help us, Lord, to draw nigh to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, brother, what number? Slip on the screen. I surrender all. Would you come? Would you come? If God spoke into your heart, let's draw nigh to the Lord tonight. Amen.
are standing while we're getting close to the Lord tonight, let me just ask you to do something. Every one of us in this room has somebody that God has put on our heart. Every one of us. You might not have thought about it today, but you've thought about it. Somebody that God has put on your heart. It's good to be close to Jesus, but it's also good to carry somebody close to Jesus with you. Tonight, in this place, as God leads you, if you want to come and, and kneel and take that name before God's throne of grace and pray for them and ask God to use you to touch them some way. We're going to sing another verse. Look, we're not going to stay here all night. But I don't want to leave without giving us an opportunity to be obedient. So let's sing another verse. God leads you come. Oh.